So I first came to Germany in August of 2019. And before I came here, I had had a couple of things about Germans. I had had the Germans drink way too much beer. I had had that Germans have no sense of humor. And <laughs> I had also had that Germans are grumpy and very, very unfriendly. <laughs> so I've been living here for two years now. And during the time I've been here, I found that, yes, beer is a big part of a culture. But not every German drinks beer, and definitely not way too much beer. I've also found that there are a lot of colleagues and friends who have been very warm and friendly and welcoming to me. They have taught me a couple of good German jokes, and they've not been like this. They've been welcoming to me, I've gone into their homes, and they've made me feel very comfortable. Now, on the other hand, I come from Kenya. And because I come from Kenya, I must be a very good long-distance runner, right? <laughs> yeah. And the reason I got very good at running long distances is because I spent all my life being chased by lions. Yeah? And the fact that I always had to run across the country to deliver messages from my grandmother in the village to my mother in the city definitely helped me practice my running. <laughs> and the fact that I did not go to school meant that I had so much time to practice my running, right? <laughs> So, of course, we know that this is also not true. Like most people here, or maybe some of the people here, I've never actually seen a lion in real life. Or, you know, well, I've seen the lion on The Lion King, but that is it. And while Kenya is home to the world's greatest marathon runners, of whom we are extremely proud, this is how I look when I go jogging for just five minutes. <laughs> and yes, we do have an extensive mobile network coverage. The Communications Authority of Kenya estimates that we have a mobile SIM penetration of 125%, and we are home to M-Pesa, the world's most successful implementation of mobile payments and mobile money transfer. And I did go to school. I grew up in an average middle-class family where my grandfather and my mother are both university professors, my grandmother was a teacher, and my father is a journalist. They not only ensured that I got a good education, but they also showed up to celebrate my successes. This is my grandmother and I during my graduation from the university with a degree in telecommunications and information engineering. The point that I'm making is this. Stereotypes are not always negative statements, but they always make false generalizations that negatively influence how we perceive entire groups of people, communities, countries, and races. It is because of negative stereotypes, mostly perpetuated by the media, that Africa has become a sensitive, almost taboo topic to talk about. When I say I want to talk about Africa, I have to start with a disclaimer. And maybe somebody gets uncomfortable and thinks, oh gosh, yeah. Here she goes, another story of poverty, disease, and war. But I would like to beg your indulgence just for a few minutes while I tell you a different story about Africa, the story of how locally developed technology solutions are positively impacting lives across the continent. And I'm going to tell you this story through my own journey working in the innovation and technology ecosystem in Africa. And finally, I'm going to share some of the ways in which I believe we can further support growth and development of the innovation and, ecos and technology ecosystem in Africa. So please come with me. My journey into the world of technology for development started with what I thought to be a missed opportunity. I was 20 years old, studying at the university, doing you know, normal things 20-year-olds do. And at the end of my second year, I was required to take an industrial attachment. So I started applying, sent out a lot of applications, but nothing came through. I was frustrated, I was disappointed, I cried a little bit, or a lot, and I thought, okay, so I'm already a failure, this is not going very well. But in my desperation, I came across a community project that was located in one of the villages in Western Kenya. I reached out to the program manager, and he agreed to take me on board. The community project was founded by a group of people from the village who then lived in the diaspora, 
and had the vision to transform their village into what they call the Sega Silicon Valley. So what they had done is, first they had sourced computers for all the primary and secondary schools in the area and connected them to the internet so that all these school children could have their first interaction with computers at an earlier age. What they had also done is that they had set up a community knowledge center where high school graduates and out-of-school youth could come and gain digital literacy skills. So, you know, they were taught basic programming, but they also taught simple things like uh, office packages. How do you write a CV? Very important skills. And so at the end of my internship or my attachment at the community project, I hadn't just gotten the practical experience, but I also had an idea what I wanted to do with my career. And so fast forward a couple of years, I've graduated from the university, and I started my first job at Safaricom, the leading mobile telecommunication company in Kenya. At Safaricom, my job was within the social innovation and later the technology for development department. And what we were supposed to do was that we were supposed to seek out partnerships with startups and other innovative organizations to build solutions that not only brought financial value to the company, but had a positive social impact. And so during this time, we were also responsible for driving the sustainable development goals, which were strongly integrated within the organization. And one of the companies that I had the honor of partnering with was Eneza Education. Eneza Education is a Kenyan startup founded in 2013 with the goal to provide digital learning content and access to a virtual tutor for school children and also for out-of-school children. So I'm just going to ask a question. Um, how many of us here are parents? Maybe you just raise your hand. Okay, thank you. So it's likely that during the last one and a half years of a pandemic, you've had to tutor your kids at home, or you know, your kids have been learning a lot at home. And maybe you've come and found that, okay, grade 10 science is not as easy as you thought. And so if you had the program or the service from Eneza Education, your child would be able to contact a teacher through their virtual tutor program called Ask a Teacher at any time and receive feedback on the difficult questions. And Eneza Education is just one of the African ed tech startups that are posit positively transforming the education sector and also bringing us closer to achieving the targets under SDG4, Sustainable Development Goal number four on quality education. And so, again, after a few years, I moved on from Safaricom, and my next adventure was at Andela. Andela is an African startup that connects organizations globally to engineering talent. And so they help organizations to hire remote talent, whether software developers, as well as designers and product managers. And actually, when I was preparing for my talk, I planned to say Andela, an African startup, but I would like to correct myself. Andela, an African unicorn. Because just last week, Andela raised its Series E funding of 200 million US dollars at a valuation of 1.5 billion dollars, joining the growing league of African unicorns. And so, the reason I joined Andela is because I was inspired by the principle on which it was founded, that brilliance is evenly distributed, even if opportunity is not. And so apart from work, I also like to volunteer. And one of the organizations that I volunteer with is the Kenya Flying Labs. And so the Kenya Flying Labs is a local robotics knowledge hub that is part of a global Wii Robotics organization. And I first joined um, the organization because I have two young brothers who kept asking me for a drone. So I had to start reading up a lot more about drones and then I got interested, and so I took a course on drones for humanitarian action. And so the reason that I was very inspired or motivated to partner with the Kenya Flying Labs is because of the motto on which the We Robotics and Kenya Flying Labs network is founded, that we leverage the power of local. So what we do is that we train and empower local communities on how they can use drones and other robotics technologies for disaster management and response. For example, what we've, do, we've done, mapping of flood-prone areas. And we've also partnered with the Kenya Forest Service to support conservation efforts by mapping and surveying Kenya's forests. And so 
there is a lot going on in the African technology ecosystem. But because I also have, um, I like adventure, <laughs> so I decided to move to Germany for a while. And currently, I work for a German medical company and support them in identifying and creating partnerships with innovative startups and tapping into the innovative potential of the African content, continent. Sorry. And so at this point, I would like to share from my experience back at home and also here in Castle, where I've seen how the region has built a very vibrant innovation ecosystem, I would like to share some of the ways in which we can further support the innovation and technology ecosystem in Africa. So again, please stay with me. So first, I believe that we need to strengthen our education systems. Now, the education systems in most African countries have improved significantly over the past decades. But it is still reality that we have the highest number of out-of-school children. And so Africa is the world's youngest continent. We have a median age of about 19 years. And for perspective, Europe has a median age of around 42 years. So that's, that's a big difference. And having the world's youngest population means that we also have the highest number of young people joining the workforce every year. And for these young people, quality education gives them hope not only to be able to pursue careers in the fields that they wish, but it also gives them an opportunity for dignified self-employment. And so if we want to ensure that we're building a better future for our children, we definitely need to strengthen our education systems. The second thing that I believe we need to do is to invest in African startups. I've already talked about Andela and the growing league of African unicorns. The funding available to African startups has been increasing over the past years. Um, this year, we are at about 2.5 billion US dollars and growing every day, which is, which is significant improvement. But it still represents only about 1% of the funding available, for example, for startups in the US. And so I could talk about the reasons why uh, we are not investing enough in African startups. I could talk about the perceived negative, um, the perceived higher risk, also perpetuated by the media. But I'm going to talk about why should we invest in African startups. If you Google why invest in Africa, you will see reasons like some of the fastest, uh, world's fastest growing economies are located in Africa. You will see that we have a rapidly growing middle class. And you'll also see that the young population means we have the highest number of young people in the workforce. But the reason I believe that we need to invest in African startups is because African founders are building solutions to the continent's most pertinent challenges. They are building the future of a continent. And so if you're investing in African startups, you're investing in the future. And the third thing that I believe that we need to do to further support innovation and technology ecosystems in Africa is to, in, to support digital transformation in rural areas. So I've talked about all the advancements that we've seen in technology, but it is still a reality that almost half of the world's population does not have access to the internet and to the digital tools required to participate in an increasingly digital world. And especially over the last 1.5 years of a pandemic, everything has been digital, and so for somebody who didn't have that access, we are leaving them behind, contrary to the UN SDG promise of leaving no one behind. And this is also close to my heart because I'm a village girl. I grew up in the village of Koros in Western Kenya, the first seven, of, seven years of my life I was with my grandmother, and I had a happy childhood there. I spent my childhood you know, riding my bicycle, playing with my friends, again, things five-year-olds do. But when I turned seven, I moved to the city with my mother, but Koros and the neighboring villages always feel like home to me. And every time that I've visited home, I've realized that the opportunities available to my friends who stayed behind and the opportunities I would have had if I stayed behind are vastly different from the opportunities I've had access to by moving you know, to the city and moving to different um, regions in the country. And so what I'm doing about this, because I'm very passionate about my home village, is that in 2020, I founded the Jedimu Elimu Trust. The Jedimu Elimu Trust was founded in honor of my grandmother, who unfortunately passed away um, from cancer in 2015. And the reason I wanted to build Jedimu is because I believe that I can make a difference for my home village and for the surrounding village. 
So we are a small organization with very big dreams, and what we want to do is to build a self-sustaining community project with three main pillars. Our first pillar, you can already guess, is education, because I've talked that education is the future, I've talked about education a lot in my talk today, and what we want to do is to support the local schools to offer not just quality education to the, um, to the students who are in school, but also to support the parents to educate their children when they are at home so that they get extra support. Our pilot project currently is the equipping of a science laboratory in one of the high schools, and we believe that the, um, through this, we will be able to improve outcomes in science subjects, but also overall performance of students. And of course, this means they then have a chance to a better future. And then second, our second pillar is on digital literacy. I've talked about how, for example, organizations like Andela are training African youth in software development and providing further opportunities. So what we want to do is to partner with the lo local vocational um, training institute so that we can have not just um, high school graduates, but also adult learners who may not have had a chance to pursue their education. We want to give them a chance to come and learn skills that could help them to work remotely. I believe most of us have been working from home for quite some time, and it works. So I don't need to be in Germany for me to be able to maybe code for a German company. And so we want to provide such opportunities for digital, through um, equipping the young people with digital um, literacy skills. And the third thing that we want to do at GDMU is economic empowerment, to offer economic empowerment opportunities for the people in the village. So we realize that most of the people in Koros and surrounding villages are farmers. And what we want to do is that we will expose them to modern farming practices. There are a lot of African um, agri-tech startups, which means that they have more opportunities for integrating technology into their farming practices. And it also means that they have an opportunity to access digital marketplaces. And why did I do this? So for me, Jedimu is not only a way to build a better future for the next generations, it's also an opportunity to honor my grandmother and the past generations. And I realize that your story is probably very different from mine, so you might be asking yourself, why is this important to me? Why should I care? I think we answered the question today when we talked about new realities. I would like to challenge you. Do you listen to the different stories? Do you listen to the stories that defy stereotypes? Do you listen to the stories that do not strip people of their dignity? I know we tend to be addicted to poverty porn. The images of poor children, I don't know, somehow seem to be very appealing. But what stories do you listen to? And I would like to challenge each, one and each and every one of us to do something. You can always do something to make a better future for the next generation. Thank you.